Good. I'm going to invite Mary to come on up so that I can pray for her. And as she comes, you know, 500 years ago, a revolution started. It was a simple revolution that was the recovery of an ancient principle, and it's this one. What needs to be known about God for our salvation and our eternal life can be known by ordinary people opening the Word of God in reliance upon the Holy Spirit and reading it plainly. That changed the European and then the entire world. I'll say that again. What needs to be known about God for our salvation and our eternal life can be known by ordinary people giving a plain reading to the Word of God in reliance upon the Holy Spirit. The task then of the teacher and the preacher is to open the Word and not get in the way of it. And that's a hallmark of our church. That's why we're so privileged to invite a teacher like Mary Wilson who's giving her life not to get in front of the Word but to open it up before us. But the key piece, the mystical piece in that, that occurs every time you have devotions in your home, gather for a small group, or get ready for worship, is that the Holy Spirit comes when we ask. He waits upon us to ask. It is not a perfunctory part of teaching the Word. It is the essential part of teaching the Word. So I'd love to pray for you and for Mary. Blessed Holy Spirit, there is a work only you can do. We are here before your word, asking that it would be plain, but that it would come off the page into our hearts. Anoint the lips of the teacher. May she put your word before us. May we leave here unchanged, and we will give you the thanks. Amen. Thank you, brother. It is so good to see you all again. I, I have to confess that last night, seeing you in the, in the gym, and then seeing you here and speaking with you, my heart is just overwhelmed. I, th literally, there have been times when I've thought, Wilson, don't cry. Don't break down in tears. I just love you so much, so deeply. Th this morning, as I was praying for you and thanking God for you, he graciously reminded me that far more important than my love for you is his love for you. I was thinking about how wonderful it is that we had the privilege last night to consider Christ, to, to gaze at him, and to see how deeply he loves us, how he's moved heaven and earth to come be with us and to satisfy us. He's not only the one who made us, he's the one who makes us whole. What love of God for you, for me, and what a privilege it is to share that with you. Last night we did, we, we looked at the Lord Jesus Christ and we saw the necessary foundation for trusting that Jesus is enough for us. That necessary foundation is seeing Christ's supremacy, his lordship over the cosmos, his lordship over the church, and his lordship over me and over you. That's the necessary foundation for believing that Jesus is sufficient for us. Well, today, we're going to look at two key demonstrations in our life that show we're really trusting Jesus is enough for us. Two manifestations of our faith in Christ's sufficiency and our all-sufficient Lord. First, we'll see that if we're truly confident that Jesus is enough for us, we'll be heavenly minded. We'll be heavenly minded. Then in our last session, we'll see that if we're truly confident that Jesus is enough for us, we'll engage his mission in this world. We'll, we'll join with him and participate in advancing the kingdom of Christ. So that's our logic for this weekend, and what a privilege it is to open God's word and to see how he speaks to us. May God do what only he can do in our time together. In our, um, yes, so we're, we're going to look at our heavenly mindedness this morning. That's a key way that we demonstrate our trust in Christ. Now, it, it's important that we consider these things be, because we face all kinds of obstacles in life. It's important that we think about how it is that we trust Christ's sufficiency because let's get real. It's not natural to us to trust in this all-sufficient Christ. We face obstacles in believing that he's enough for us, in believing that he loves us deeply and cherishes us. We, we redeemed sinners who have been made whole in Christ. We live in a broken and sinful world. <laughs> we face the world, the flesh, and the devil. And, and we've got to wage war against our flesh in order to trust Christ. 
That, that old nature of ours with its old identity and its old ambitions and its old mindsets, we've got to wage war against this flesh. We experience the tension of the already and the not yet. We've heard of this, haven't we? The, the already and the not yet. We're already made whole in Christ. Thanks be to God. And yet, we aren't yet experiencing the consummate effect of his ministry of reconciliation. We're waiting for that day when the Lord Jesus will return in glory and we shall see him as he is and therefore be like him. We're in the midst of this tension, this, this already and not yet. And in this place, in this tension, we must strain ahead. We press ahead. Those who have received Christ Jesus the Lord, we now walk in him. And this, this takes hard work. <laughs> We're aiming to become more of who God has made us to be in Christ, to experience those lavish, profound spiritual blessings that God has poured on us through His Son. So this morning, we're going to open up Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4, and we're going to see in this passage, this is really where, in certain respects, Paul introduces the challenge of Christian sanctification. He begins to show us how we actually put our trust in Christ's sufficiency what it looks like to mature as Christians, to grow up in Christ and trust that He and He alone can satisfy us. He and He alone can fulfill us. And I just simply want to say how much I've learned from you, <laughs> this congregation, about what it looks like to trust Jesus and grow up in Christ. I, I came to you as a young buck, <laughs> a very young buck, and yes, a young what? Garrett, um, please don't correct me. No, just kidding. <laughs> I forgot Alex the young buck. You all, my older brothers and sisters in the faith especially, you've taught me so much about what it looks like to grow up in Jesus. So I'm humbled as I stand here and, and ask God to encourage us in this work. We're going to divide our session this morning in, in two parts. First, we're going to take a step back. We're going to zoom back a bit and get an overview, a general framework of the letter of Colossians. Now, my hope is that this will help us uh, get ready for Garrett's 14 weeks in Colossians. This is, yeah, you're, there you go. Mitzi's like, oof, 14 weeks. <laughs> this setting, this is, this is a unique sort of setting where we can do some more Bible study, academic sort of work and just step back and get a general framework. That's gonna, we're going to take about 10 minutes to do that. Then we're going to press into this particular passage, Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4, and open that together. So let's start by making some general observations about Colossians, and be sure to have your Bibles in front of you because we're going to be flipping around. We mentioned last night that this letter, is, it's a personal letter from the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul writes this letter with the help of his young protege, Timothy. And it's a letter to a local church, a local body of believers at Colossae. We remember, don't we, that Paul had never actually met these believers, and yet his letter is just abounding in warmth and love for them. He gives thanks for their faith and love based on the hope that they've received in the gospel. And he's been praying specifically for them for a while now, ever since he heard the report that this body of believers was formed because Christ had brought them to himself. So he's been praying for them for a while. But the reason he writes this letter is because he's heard another report, <laughs> another more recent report from Epaphras or Epaphras, however you're going to say it, that there were some false teachers among them who were actually leading this local church astray. We remember, don't we, from last night that these false teachers were teaching that Jesus is not enough for a Christian's full maturity, their full growth. They need to, to add some mystical spiritual strivings or some moral and ritual strivings. They need to add these things and supplement the gospel in order to be mature. Paul hears this report and he's, he knows that this means they have abandoned the gospel. They've, they've tried to, to compromise the gospel and mesh their new spiritual experiences of coming to Christ with their old religious habits and practices. 
So he takes up his pen and he writes to them, aiming to show them the all-sufficient Savior who loves them, the only one who can satisfy them and keep them until the end. Now, something we ought to keep in mind as we enjoy and delight in this letter is that Paul writes this letter from prison. We don't know exactly where he's imprisoned, probably Rome, but that is the context in which Paul writes this letter. We see it in the end uh, in chapter 3. Paul mentions his imprisonment. We'll, we'll see that later on today. And then at, in 4.18, in some of his final words, he writes, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. So the one who pins this letter about the all-sufficiency of the Lord Jesus Christ is in prison. <laughs> this isn't some pampered preacher writing from the comforts of an ease of life. <laughs> no, this is, this is a man who is, who is struggling. He's suffering. He's facing severe hardship. And yet he knows that Jesus is enough for him. <laughs> Friends, that means that for me and for you, for every one of us in this room, none of us is beyond the scope of Paul's message. <laughs> if you're in the midst of a, of a really difficult situation in life and you're facing peculiar pains and complications and complexities, this is a letter for you <laughs> written by a man who knows what it's like to suffer and knows what it's like to know Christ in the midst of sufferings and to see his sufficiency. We want to bear in mind that Paul writes this letter from prison, a letter that abounds with thanksgiving because he knows the Lord Jesus and he knows he's enough. So Colossians is a personal letter written from the Apostle Paul with the help of Timothy to a local body of believers at Colossae, and it's written from prison. Let's take a moment and think about the whole letter's structure. How does Paul shape his letter? And wonderfully, Paul actually shapes his letter in a way that supports his main idea. <laughs> so Paul is emphasizing the sufficiency of Christ, not just in his message, but in his method. Not just what he says, but how he says it. Please turn with me now to Colossians 2, verses 6 and 7. Now, Paul shapes his letter, as was common in the day, with an initial greeting and with a final conclusion, a final greeting. But in the, the main body of the letter, we actually see that it's, it's, in certain respects, divided into two interrelated parts. Colossians 2, 6 and 7, these verses that we're about to read, it functions like the book's pivot, <laughs> that a smooth transition between Paul's first part of the letter and his second part of the letter. So let's read these verses. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Before the Apostle Paul instructs these believers about what they must do, he reminds them about what God has done. <laughs> he, he shows us in the first main part of his letter, we saw this last night, the text that we read last night was in the first main part of his letter. He shows us who the Lord Jesus Christ is and what he's done for us and what he promises us. That's, that's the anchor of his letter. Then he transitions here in Colossians 2, 6, and 7 to say, in light of what God has done for you in Christ, walk in him, <laughs> grow up in him, trust him, live your whole life in light of what God has done for you in the gospel. That's the, the basic structure because the, the gospel isn't merely the starting point of the Christian life. It's the ending point and every point in between. <laughs> They aren't to receive the gospel of grace and then go about their Christian life as if it were up to them or as if they could be satisfied by other things. No, we walk in the very one whom we've received. That's the sum of the Christian life. Now, friends, some of you will be more interested in this than others, but even the grammar, don't you love grammar? Even the grammar of this letter supports this idea of these two interrelated parts. Now, formally, an imperative is a command, like 
give me water, or give me chocolate is better. <laughs> it's a command. From Colossians 1.1 to 2.5, there are zero formal imperatives in the original language, zero. From 2.6 all the way through 4.6, there are 29 <laughs> formal imperatives. Even the, the grammar of this letter shows us that the most basic flow is, therefore, you've received Christ Jesus the Lord. Now, in light of the gospel, on the basis of the gospel, trusting the Lord Jesus Christ through the gospel, walk in him. <laughs> As many of you know, this is the sequence of so many of Paul's letters. Doctrine first, first, and then practice. <laughs> We remember that in the letter of Ephesians, chapters one through three focus on doctrine, what God has done for us. And then Paul comes to four through six, which the chapters four through six in Ephesians, which show us then how we must live, dealing with ethical issues. And then we know that the, the magisterial exposition of salvation in Romans one through 11, that magisterial exposition is then followed by a careful exposition of the ethic of love in chapters 12 through, 20, through 16. This is always the Christian sequence, <laughs> the, the gospel logic, what God has done first, and then how we then respond to him. Our action is not primary. Thanks be to God. God's is. <laughs> so even the very structure of this letter of Colossians proclaims Paul's truth that Christ is the all-sufficient Savior in whom we must trust, in whom we must walk. So now, let's be sure that we understand where our passage this morning, Colossians 3, 1 through 4, where it comes in the logic of this whole letter. Keep where you are in Colossians 2, 6. You'll notice that here, as I've said, this is where Paul really begins his formal ethical instruction. And he starts, look at two, look, at, look what follows chapter 2, 6. He, he starts by focusing on their crumbling ethical foundation. The fact that they've distorted the gospel by believing in this false teaching. And that's where he starts. He wants to pull the splinter out, right? He wants to deal with the issues at hand before he then gives the general commandments about how every believer walks in Christ. And in Colossians 2, 8 through 23, Paul is exposing how enslaving and how empty is this idea of Jesus plus. It, it appears to be wise, but it has no power in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Paul is just going right at it. He's exposing its enslaving emptiness and instead calling these believers to trust in the fullness of Christ the one in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and we now have been filled by him. Wow. So Paul is really handling this in the, the end of chapter two. Then he turns in our text, and he begins to exhort the Colossians about the how-tos of Christian sanctification, how it is that we live out of our union with Christ, if it's true that we've died in Christ and we've been raised in Christ, how then shall we live? Well, I'm so glad you asked because that's what Paul is going to show us. Look at your Bibles again at the beginning of Colossians 3, and you'll notice our, our text will be 1 through 4, but look at verse 5. You'll see that immediately following our passage, Paul begins to focus on what they must put to death what it is they must renounce, those actions and attitudes that every Christian must renounce. And then look at verse 12 in chapter three. He begins to focus on the particulars of what they then must put on, what it is that Christians must affirm and embrace. So even as we've looked at this structure, we can see that our particular text this morning, verses one through four, it comes right before Paul fleshes out these particulars. In other words, he seems to be suggesting by the very structure of his letter that, that Colossians 3, 1 through 4, gives us the first principle of Christian sanctification. And the first thing we shall see is a robust heavenly-mindedness. A robust heavenly-mindedness. So we can say that if we're truly trusting that Jesus is enough for us, <laughs> 
if we're truly believing that he's our all-sufficient Savior, we will demonstrate this in heavenly-mindedness. At long last, let's dig in to Colossians 3, 1 through 4. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. (laughs) Heavenly-mindedness. I wonder how many sermons and evangelical pulpits this weekend will focus on this theme. (laughs) For for Paul, it was fundamental. For many of us church-going people, it, it seems exotic. For Paul, it was the beginning, the starting point. But so often we treat heavenly mindedness and texts like this as those that we only share with older saints, <laughs> preparing them to see the Lord. There's an old saying that, that so and so is so heavenly minded that she's no earthly good. <laughs> the fact of the matter is that you will never meet a person like that. In fact, the, the opposite is the case. I've often heard my dad mention the old Puritan, Samuel Rutherford, and here's how he describes the Christian person. He says, he has his feet firmly planted on the ground, his hands gripped to the plow, and his head in the heavenlies. Paul's point is that we aren't going to be able to enjoy the all-sufficiency of our Lord Jesus Christ without a vibrant heavenly-mindedness. Now, heavenly-mindedness, you'll see in your text, in the text, has a positive and a negative dimension. In verse 1, he says positively, seek the things that are above. And in verse 2, set your minds on things that are above. But then look, negatively, he says in verse 2, not on things that are on the earth. Now, by repeating the command to seek what is above and to set our minds on things that are above, Paul is stressing the importance of heavenly-mindedness. Heavenly Well, what does it mean to look heavenward? It means to look to Christ. (laughs) It means to to look to the the enduring city whose builder is God. (laughs) It means to turn to to things that are good and holy, to, to turn to God, to turn to Christ. Now, we all have choices to make about what it is we set our minds on. Our mind, my mind, your mind, it doesn't just run on autopilot. No, it's it's a product of our heart. What we love and what we hate, that's what we think about. It determines our mindset. And for those of us who are believers, we've, we've got to give our hearts to the Lord. We've got to train our minds. We've got to strain to set our minds on what is above. Paul says in Romans 8, he he describes the, the mind that's set on the flesh. And he calls us instead to set our mind on the Spirit. So it's a choice. It's a battle we must engage in and take up by the power of the Spirit. Now with his negative commandment in verse 2, Paul is simply saying that you cannot be both a spiritually minded person and a worldly minded person, not on things that are on the earth. No, if you're going to be heavenly minded, you'll renounce worldliness in your thinking. You'll renounce it. Jesus, of course, taught this regularly. He said, you cannot love both God and mammon. (laughs) They're diametrically opposed to one another. They're, They're mutually exclusive. Now, in my experience, heavenly mindedness is hard work. It requires rigorous discipline. It's hard to think of a person who who better illustrates the the power of discipline and mental toughness and setting one's mind on the prize than Nick Saban, just kidding, than Drew Brees. (laughs) I thought about Nick Saban and I thought, no, that would not go over well. But but, but it's hard to imagine a a person who better illustrates this, this setting one's mind with steady focus Now, I believe, I may be wrong, some of you, Boyd, you can correct me, but I believe he's entering into his 18th NFL season. Now, think 
about his driving ambition to be the best quarterback he can be. Think about, he, probably for, for over 30 years, his daily practices and habits and disciplines, they've been shaped by this driving ambition to be the, the best quarterback he can be. Consider all the things to which he said no in order to say yes to this. <laughs> Think about the, the hours of watching film so that he can learn to pick apart the defense. See, I'm in my stance. Pick apart the defense. I, I, I was a quarterback once in um, sorority football league, and it did not go down well. So don't learn from my stance. But Drew Brees, he, he exemplifies the power of fixing one's mind on something. The driving concern in Colossians 3, 1 through 4 is that we fix our minds on heaven, that we live out what it means to belong to an all-sufficient Savior. And what I want us to notice together are the particular incentives that Paul gives us for cultivating this new mindset, the particular ways that he motivates us to engage that hard work and discipline of fixing our gaze on heaven. There are three of them that we'll notice. First of all, look at verse 1a. Paul shows us that we are to set our minds on heaven, first of all, because we're fit for there. <laughs> we're fit for there. If then you have been raised with Christ, he says. <laughs> now this connects to his major argument that, that he's made in chapter two. When we come to faith in Christ, we're united with Christ in both his death and in his resurrection. Our very nature has changed. We, we share his DNA. We partake in him. We've been filled in him. Well then, Paul says, it's only natural that we should set our minds on things above because we've been fit for there. That's where we belong. You know, in, in my experience, one of the, the greatest challenges that I face every day is to believe what God says about my new identity in Christ, to believe that he's made me new in Christ. Tim Keller once said that sin is the despairing refusal to find your deepest identity and your relationship and service to God. Some of you may remember the story, it's a true story, that broke back in the, the 1982, and some of you may not remember, but the 1982 newspaper of the 66-year-old Yvonne Mary Henderson. Her middle name is a great, solid name. I recommend it. Yvonne Mary Henderson. This is 1982. For 17 years, Yvonne Mary Henderson had lived in the streets of Miami as what the newspaper called a bag lady. Now, she had been sleeping in the streets, fighting off muggers and abusers, scrounging around for food for 17 years. But in 1982, some social workers began interacting with her, and they soon discovered something about Yvonne Mary Henderson that was truly remarkable. In fact, they remarked on it in the newspaper article. <laughs> That's for free. Yvonne Mary Henderson was the heiress of a colossal fortune. She had money in banks all over the world. Her father had served as a high-ranking diplomat in the British Foreign Office. He was, he was actually the, the head of the Far East Department of the British Foreign Office. And amazingly, this reality about her identity wasn't news to her. She'd been telling people for years that she was someone important, that, that she had money all over the world, but no one believed her. And she didn't do anything to take advantage of what was legally hers. She just kept living on the streets. A common reason that I don't mature in my spiritual life is that I refuse to embrace my true identity, my identity in Christ. Now, we may affirm with our lips and, and sing praises to God that we are co-heirs with Christ of a colossal inheritance. But friends, how many of us are choosing to, to live in the streets like bag ladies, 
We revert to our old pre-Christ identities and, and we don't take advantage of what God has granted us in His Son, of the ways that He's filled us with, with all His fullness. But to grow up in Christ, we've got to embrace our new identity. When we don't embrace our identity in Christ, we're going to be seeking fulfillment elsewhere. It shows that we don't trust Jesus is enough for us. We aren't really finding him sufficient. Now, everything else in this passage, Colossians 3, 1 through 4, it flows logically from Paul's starting point here in verse 1 about our union with Christ, our new identity in Christ. So the character of our Christian life, including our heavenly mindedness, it derives its fundamental rationale from our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. The wellspring of Christian growth then ought to be a dynamic, growing relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, who is Lord over the cosmos, Lord over the church, and Lord over us. Friends, the fact that we're united to Christ means that we truly belong. <laughs> we belong to him. <laughs> he is ours and we are his, as we sang moments ago. So we see that we must set our minds on heaven because we're fit for there. <laughs> it's who we are. It's who God has made us to be. Now Paul gives us a second incentive for heavenly mindedness. Look at verse 1b. Our Savior is there. <laughs> it's not just that we're fit for there. Our Savior is there. That's why we've got to set our minds on heaven because Christ is there seated at the right hand of God. He is our life, so we set our minds where he is. So friends, a key diagnostic question that we've got to ask ourselves is what am I seeking? <laughs> what are you seeking? What do you really want in life? Where is your mind? Where is your heart focused? What do you treasure the most? In these verses, Paul's after something more fundamental than our behavior, than our activities. He's after our hearts. <laughs> he's after our hearts. He, he's talking about our deepest motivations and loyalties. He's saying that every person who's been raised in Christ has the privilege of setting our mind on Christ, of seeking Him. What, a, what grace is presupposed here in this command? Paul's bidding us to orient our whole lives, our aspirations, our dreams on Christ because that's where He is in heaven. So we Christians must cultivate a Christward ambition, moving toward Him in our hearts and our minds. How wonderful is it that God bids us to aspire for the things of heaven because he wants to bless us from heaven and ultimately with heaven. <laughs> what joy. So brothers and sisters, in Christ, we're, we're set free from slavish ambitions to earthly lesser things. <laughs> we're, we're, we believers, yes, we, we work hard in our professions. We seek to do good among our neighbors. We care about the things of this earth, but we do it because our minds are firmly fixed on heaven where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Our aim to please the Lord Jesus Christ relativizes every aim in our life. Now that means we don't live to manage our image. We don't live for success or prosperity in our business place or our work environment. We don't live to make everyone around us happy, to make them like us. We don't even live for our families. Their joys and happiness in life is important to us, but it doesn't occupy the central place in our hearts. We don't live to, to build a legacy so that people will remember our great name and talk about us fondly once we're gone. In fact, we don't live for ourselves at all. Or do we? If you're anything like me, so often your heart is divided. So often we Christians, we're, we're sometimes not even aware that functionally our driving ambitions are not Christ-centered. They're not Christ-word. 
We, we go to church on Sunday mornings and even stay treats on Saturdays, and we even teach stay treats on Saturdays. And so we feel confident that fundamentally we're driven by Christ, by His glory. Fundamentally, we fixed our mind on Him. But in truth, so often what really motivates us, what really gets us up in the morning, it's the ambition to make a name for ourselves, to make ourselves great, to be noticed and appreciated, to, to cultivate a carefree, easy life. It drives us. And friends, I've been struck by this as, I, as I've studied for this text. I am deluding myself if I think that I can hold on to Christward ambition here and also to less, lesser earthly ambition here as if the two can mix and stay together. It's delusional. Without even realizing it sometimes, I put Jesus in a corner in my life. I relegate his all-encompassing relevance as the Lord of the cosmos to just my religious activities and associations. So often, our hearts are divided. We have competing ambitions. A number of years ago, a friend of mine whom I'll call Sarah, not her name, so you can rule out every Sarah you know, a friend of mine named Sarah came to Memphis, Tennessee, which is where my family lives and where I live now, actually. And she came to teach the Bible among some Christian mothers of middle school and high school daughters, okay? So she came to teach the Bible to these women who had daughters in middle school and high school. And the, these mothers had their daughters in very affluent, prestigious prep schools in the city. At the time, my friend was single, and she was in her mid-30s, and she had been devoting herself for a number of years to studying and teaching the Bible, particularly among college students. Now, I realize the awkwardness of my telling a story about a woman who's single and in her 30s and, and teaches the Bible because I'm single, I'm in my 30s, and occasionally I teach the Bible. But hang with me because I've learned so much from her example, and I, and I imagine that you'll be convicted along with me. My friend Sarah met with this group of Christian mothers, and throughout the day they shared about their hopes and their fears for their daughters, their middle school and high school daughters. They, they shared with her about their concerns. And then she opened up God's Word and she taught the Bible to them. Now, one woman must have been particularly impressed by her Bible teaching, and she said with enthusiasm after Sarah taught, she said, Sarah, we want our daughters to be just like you. And Sarah looked right back at the woman and all the other women, and she said, no, you don't. She said, you want your daughters to be popular, successful. You want them to join the same social clubs that you've joined. You want them to embrace the same lifestyle and the same set of worldly values that you and your husband have embraced. You want them to marry wealthy, upwardly mobile, prestigious young men from prestigious families. You want them to attend the same colleges that you've attended and go about their lives in the same way. Those are your ambitions for your daughters, and they know it. Now, everybody doesn't have the courage and perhaps the audacity of young Sarah to, to tell it like it is, but we can learn from what she said to these mothers. It's true, isn't it, that sometimes as parents and as grandparents, we're more thrilled about our children or our grandchildren's academic accolades and achievements than we are about their growing a, a personal, dynamic relationship with the Lord of the cosmos. We can be more eager to share at a dinner table that our son or grandson was the valedictorian of his class than that he's begun faithfully to commit to reading the scriptures and, and engaging in prayer with the Lord. We're, we're far more excited to tell our friends when we run into them in the grocery store that our granddaughter is marrying a prestigious young man than we would be if we, we knew that she was marrying a, a godly man who may incidentally have no social prestige, no social standing. And friends, this is so convicting to me because the truth is that what most excites me and conversely what most devastates me shows me where my heart is. It shows me on what I've fixed my mind. 
This is not just the case for what excites us about our children and grandchildren. It's the case about us as well. What most thrills you? (laughs) What most grieves you? Are they things related to heaven where Christ is seated at the right hand of God? To cultivate a Christward ambition, we've got to ask God to show us the ways that our heart is divided. Christian growth, is, it's a constant process of repentance, of renouncing what is below our earthly ambitions and embracing our Christward ambitions. We, we don't maintain a Christward ambition in neutral. God graciously, as Garrett reminded us, gives us his word He speaks to us in his word and calls us to repentance and faith again and again, and he grants us his spirit. Now, I'll say that that one of the the most basic practical ways that we can cultivate a Christward ambition is simply to read God's word every day, to commit to hear from him, to hear from this Christ who's seated on heaven. Now, if it's been a while since you've spent time reading the Bible day by day, commit again today. It's a fresh start right now. Even better, ask the person sitting beside you to to read through Colossians together as, as Garrett is preaching through it. Read through that today. Read it with a neighbor. Start committing yourself afresh to reading his word and asking him to cultivate in your own heart a Christward ambition. God has given us a remarkable gift in this book. May we be wise to read it. So we set our minds on heaven first because we're fit for there. Second, because Christ is there, our Savior is there. And now Paul concludes with a third incentive. We're going there. (laughs) We're going there. Look at verses three and four. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. There are two main points I want us to grasp from these two verses. First, Jesus is coming to us in glory. And second, we are going to him in glory. First of all, we're heavenly minded because we are deeply forever longing for the return of our glorious King. Jesus is coming to us in glory. One of my good friends uh, years ago was engaged in university ministry. And that particular university ministry, I learned so much from looking at the ways that they faithfully evangelized students, college students. Every year they would get together and have a retreat for these students and the staff workers. And on this particular retreat, a young woman who had just come to faith in Christ recently, she joins them for this retreat. She's a baby Christian. When you arrive at the retreat, you get a little brochure that tells you the different breakout sessions and, you know, what to anticipate with just the titles of the different talks. So my friend is over here with a group of other students talking, and all of a sudden, this young, recent convert bursts through the door and I'll try not to scandalize you by yelling. I noticed you all gave me a bigger microphone to accommodate my bigger mouth, but (laughs) this young convert bursts through the door and says, Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. Now, my friend and these students were a little startled, but they then began to work out what had happened. This woman had seen on the brochure that that there was a talk scheduled about Jesus' return, and it was simply entitled, Jesus is Coming Back. And she hadn't heard that before. (laughs) She had, the person who evangelized her had missed this crucial part of the gospel. She had no idea that her king would be returning in glory and splendor to claim her as her own, as his own. And this was wild, raucous joy in her heart as she heard this news. And friends, that's exactly appropriate. Wild, raucous joy. Her king is coming back and and she knows it. We ought to live every moment expecting, joyfully expecting Christ's return. Friends, do you contemplate this? 
Do you you think about the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of the cosmos, the the Lord over the cosmos, Lord over the church, Lord over you, he's coming back soon. (laughs) If we aren't contemplating the reality of our King's return, then we're going to be tempted to find satisfaction elsewhere. But if we are contemplating his return, then we're deeply satisfied in him. So our heavenly mindedness is motivated by our Savior's imminent return, but please don't miss this second aspect that Paul presents in verses three and four. Not only is Jesus returning to us, but we are returning to him. The language here in these verses, it's very interesting. Paul uses the the word hidden in in verse three, and and it's a, a Greek word from which we get the word cryptic. So so Paul is saying that we're now cryptically in Christ. (laughs) To the world, we're incognito. They don't know that we're sons and daughters of the king, but, and they have no idea about this, but one day they will find out. (laughs) We will be revealed in our true identity. The world will look up and see that Jesus is King Messiah and they will see that we are his people. Look at verse four, when Christ returns, not only will his identity be made fully known, but ours will. A few years ago, I attended a wedding of a really good friend of mine in Illinois. And this bride is a believer, and she was marrying, uh, she married a man who is also a Christian brother. So two believers getting married. Now this bride grew up in a very difficult home, full of alcoholism and verbal abuse, lots of pain and hardship. And truth be told, she has struggled her whole life to understand who she is and how she fits in this world on account of that really difficult background. Some of you can relate to this. Now, watching her walk down the aisle, honestly, was one of the most remarkable moments that I've ever experienced in life. She was the most demonstrably joyful bride I've ever seen. She was weeping and laughing hysterically simultaneously, which I didn't know was possible, but it's possible. (laughs) Weeping, laughing hysterically simultaneously. Now, when she was walking down the aisle, it caught all of us so off guard that so many of us were affected by her infectious joy, affected by her infectious joy, whatever, just, you know, play with it. Even the preacher had tears streaming down his face. At the reception, I went and I spoke with the preacher and I said, what got into you, you know? What, what, what was it about that that, that you, you just couldn't pull yourself together? And he said this, finally, she belongs. Her whole life she's struggled and longed for security and she'll still have to struggle and long for security, she'll still have to work this out, but finally, she belongs to a man who loves her and will lay down his life for her. This captures some of the drama of the gospel, doesn't it? She belongs. One of the main reasons that we believers choose to operate out of our old identity is that deep down, we fear that God will reject us someday. We, we feel that even though he's accepted us in Christ, that maybe we're in a bit of a probationary period. You know, he, he's testing it out. We, we, we view ourselves more like an indentured servant than a child. But the truth is that no sin or failure of yours catches God the Father off guard. He's not surprised by your weakness. He's not surprised that you've been a Christian for decades and yet you still struggle to trust him. (laughs) He's not surprised or caught off guard that that you're wrestling in your spiritual life, that you're inadequate, that you're failing day and day again, that we get discouraged and depressed. He's, He's not testing you out. He understood fully your desperate condition when he sent his son to die for you. He knows your weakness utterly. He's not caught off guard by your wrestlings. His love for you is unshakable. Believer in Christ, your life is hidden with Christ in God. You are as safe in Christ as he is in God. This is rock solid assurance. And when Christ appears, you will appear with him in glory. 
Our story culminates in a wedding that will be far more dramatic than that about which I just told you. The, the, the bride, we, the church, dressed in splendor for the bridegroom, and he brings us into everlasting joy in our everlasting home together. This is the, the outcome of our day-by-day discipline to fix our mind on heaven where Christ is. This is the, the glorious outcome that every one of us who has been raised in Christ will one day be glorified in Christ when we see him face to face and behold our Father's loving benediction gaze on us. So Paul teaches us that the Lord Jesus Christ is the all-sufficient Savior and that we demonstrate our confidence in his sufficiency by our heavenly mindedness. We set our minds on heaven because we're fit for there because our Savior is there, and because we're going there. Can you possibly imagine anything more wonderful than this? Let's pray. Father, our hearts are freshly exultant over the truths of this gospel. We are freshly amazed that this King of glory has made peace by the blood of his cross. We thank you for all the ways that you have lavished your love on us. Father, we thank you that you haven't just claimed us as your own by adopting us, but that you promise by the power of Christ, by the power of your spirit, you promise to keep us faithful to the end. You give us the grace to endure. Oh, Father, we are so grateful. We are deeply satisfied in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we praise you in his name and for his sake. Amen.